those are the stories that you need to bring up when you're talking about why you want to be a doctor. That's what really connects oh, yeah. the dots. Ask Dr. Gray pre-med Q&A brought to you by Blueprint MCAT. How are you doing today? Okay, how are you? I am great. What can I help you with? Yeah, so right now um, I'm currently like obviously in the cycle and uh, secondaries have been coming in. Um, and my GPA and like MCAT um, aren't on the stronger side. Like I have a 3.5 GPA and it was upwards, but then like once COVID hit, it kind of like waned down and then I took the MCAT May 14th and, you know, thought I was doing pretty good. But, you know, once I submitted, got the score back, like around the 500. So it wasn't like what I wanted. And okay. um, for some schools, like I look on the MSAR and like their ranges, like, <laughs> it's like, you know, 500, right? So I'm like, okay, maybe there's possibilities there. But um, honestly, though, like I'm thinking like, okay, like I should probably just like retake this exam. But at the same time, I'm like, you know, I already spent all this money. And then, you know, the schools that, you know, I have a slight chance with, you know, I might as well just like apply with them. So I kind of want to come to you to kind of have like guidance on like what the best things to do. Yeah. Uh, step one, ignore what the MSAR says. Okay. Sure. That MCAT and GPA data on the MSAR scares everyone. Right, the the median MCAT score for Podunk University Medical School is like five eighteen. I'm like, <laughs> like who gets a five eighteen? Like, not a lot of people, right? It's like ninety fifth percentile, whatever it is. So, obviously, not everyone can get a a, a five eighteen. And so, when you look at that data, it it doesn't give you a full picture of what medical schools are actually doing it gives you a very skewed perspective, right? And remember that the, the MCAT data, the GPA data, those are median numbers. Half the class is below that number. Half the class is below, uh, above it. Again, like half a class above a 518, okay, sure, I guess. <laughs> good, good for them. But there are still lots of people below that number. You look at the 25th percentile number, the 10th percentile number, and you go, 10% of the class is still below that number. And medical schools are accepting those people. Who are those people? I don't know. They're people who get in. They're people who have a 500, who have a 3.5, who have something else in their application that's like, oh, this is really cool. I, I want you in my class. There are, like, I'll, I'll say it, th there are people that students or schools are looking for diversity. So at, as a black man, they may look at your numbers differently. And that's okay, because we we know the AAMC's data shows that that black students score much much lower than their white counterparts on the MCAT. And there are lots of reasons for that. Medical schools know that, so they're not judging you on everyone. They're judging you as you. They're looking at all of you in context and going, "Do we like this person?" Does he, and, and, and I get a lot of flack for this when I say good enough, right? Is he good enough to do well in our school? And every school knows these numbers. They know historically that students who get, I'll, I'll say like a, a 496, right? They'll say every student that we've accepted above a 496 does just fine in our school. They may not have the best grades. They may not have the best step one scores, and hopefully they still pass, right? Um, but they, they pass, but they, they do well enough. So we have the data, each school has the data that says these students do well enough. We are okay accepting these students. And that's where cutoffs come from, right? That's where schools typically internally have their own cutoffs that says every student that we accept below 496 fails step one at least one time. One time. Every student that we accept below a three point whatever GPA or a two point whatever GPA, regardless of, of upward trends, they fail at least one class during their first year. All right, schools have this data. They're looking at it. That's how they make these decisions. And so for you with a three five, that's a good GPA. So I'm not I'm not concerned about your GPA. A five hundred MCAT score, wherever you are at, a five hundred, that's average. Right, the the average now is a little bit higher. It's five hundred one and a half, I think, um, but but that's typically going to be good enough. 
So I wouldn't worry about your stats. Apply. Again, this is in context of, of having diversity as well for medical schools. And it's just is what it is. You, yeah, I always say you play the card you're dealt, right? So do everything else. And a 3.5 is a good GPA for anyone. Uh, apply, do everything else, clinical experience, shadowing, all this, all these other things. Show that you're a good, a good person, just like anyone else should be doing in an application. And let the medical schools tell you that's not good enough, regardless of who you are. Thank you. And also for like, um, for me, like personally, like my kind of theme slash story, the way I got into like medicine was like through like, um, like teaching and, you know, tutoring and stuff like that. Cause that's like where like I find the most like fulfillment and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, so kind of like in the back of my mind, I was thinking like, Oh, if you know, if they don't have like, you know, the top stats and stuff like that, then like they might like not, you know, think like, Oh, you want to be like a teacher, but like, you know, you're not like have, you don't have like a 4.0 GPA and a five, you know, 15 plus MCAT or something like that. So, you know, that's just like, <laughs> I don't know if that's just like me, you know, overthinking things or. Yeah. Um, the, the- some of the best teachers, right, coaches, think of athletics. Some of the best coaches are not the most athletic people. Some of the best teachers, you don't have to be smart to teach. You just, Like smart, a.k.a. the best grades. But you understand, and some of the best teachers are actually the ones that struggle in, in school because they had to work really hard to figure out concepts that worked for them, and they can turn around and teach those to other people. So don't don't worry about what they're going to think about your grades and be like, oh, you're a teacher, whatever. You're applying to medical school, so they don't really care about your teaching. <laughs> I mean, it'll be interesting to them. But yeah, yeah I, right. I, you're you're getting too far into the weeds. You're you're again very typical pre med student trying to you're overthinking this <laughs> and going, yeah. what are the ways that they are not going to like me? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Flip it. Yeah. Flip it. How awesome am I as a as a person that they're gonna they're gonna love this and they're gonna love that they're gonna like this? I also apply to like DO schools and as well, um, just as like you know the uh, like when I get my score back as well. And I was planning to apply DO anyway. Okay. Um, but I do have like a question. Like I know like I've been reading like you know tons of you know videos and watching a whole bunch of stuff like DO versus MD and like I kind of get like similar things. And I, I remember I watched your video about you know DO versus MD and stuff. So like you know. Obviously, I don't know what specialty I want to go into, but, you know, sometimes when I look at videos, they're saying like, oh, you know, if you go to DO route, like, you're going to be like, you know, very limited in like what you can do. But, yeah. You know, if I go to med school and I'm like, oh, I, I want to be a primary care physician, like, then, you know, that's great. So like right now, like, I'm not really, you know, like, I'm not really like uh, decided yet. So yep. I think once I'm in med school. DO equals MD. And again, I get lots of other... <laughs> influencers are like it's different sure there is still a stigma out there typically in more competitive specialties and at more competitive programs so if your goal is to go to the northeast and and do your residency training at harvard as an ophthalmologist there may be some bias there against dios if you want to be an ophthalmologist and you're okay with going to uh, um, a more kind of midwestern some smaller residency program that trains perfectly fine ophthalmologists, they may accept you as a DO. There are DO ophthalmologists out there. There are DO radiologists and DO orthopedic surgeons and DO every single competitive specialty out there. It's not the degree, it's the person. And then, so, like, I don't know if, uh, like how much like verse or well like versed are you are with like different curriculums for med uh, med schools and stuff. Mm-hmm. So like you know problem based learning and like you know re- or traditional lecture style like you know kind of w- what are the you know consensus like what's like the best one to go to because I don't there really... isn't there isn't one it's it's whatever works for you um, right so so um, I went to a traditional. Yeah. Um, curriculum when I went to school. I didn't know about systems-based curriculums or else I would have tried to focus on finding a school that that was systems-based if I could get into one. Um, Problem-based learning, flipped classrooms, all of these different styles, you really have to do some self-reflection and go, where do I think I will fit best? 
Now, a lot of students are just like, I'll go wherever. <laughs> like, whoever accepts me, that's where I'll go. But I think you can do that work up front and apply to schools that you think are going to, to help you thrive as a medical student so that when you get there, you know. Like, all of the schools that are going to accept me, I've already put in the work. I understand that I'm going to be successful at all of them. And there may be schools that have different curriculum that you're like, I can be successful at this school, even though it has a traditional curriculum because of X, Y, and Z. And I can be a su successful at that school with a PBL systems-based curriculum because of whatever, right? And so you just, you just have to figure out what you think is best for you. Figure out and, and understand and, and ask questions. Uh, try to find students at each of the schools, different curriculum styles and go, what do you like about it? What don't you like about it? And try to integrate that into who you are as a person as well. And then, sorry, I'm kind of like jumping back and forth. Yeah. Seeing like different, but, um, so for the secondary application, there's like one question that I, you know, well, I'm pretty sure it's like coming in some other schools application, which is, um, you know, how did COVID-19 like impact you and things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously, you know, just a little personal background, like, you know, I was, I went to like a predominantly uh, white uh, institution uh, Christian institution. It was like pretty small and stuff. And, you know, so I was not really necessarily like isolated, you know, th the whole time there, but I was definitely like, you know, like the only like uh, minority in my science classes and things like that. And, you know, once, you know, COVID hit and stuff like that, I obviously started to feel like, you know, a little bit like even more isolated and then, you know, didn't really have like the best of like, like I was like in a bad place essentially, but I don't want to like, you know, be like, oh, you know, my mental health is like, you know, so bad at that, that time. And like, I don't know how to like, you know, change and stuff like that to give, you know, medical schools like the impression that like, you know, something like I there's something wrong with me, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? That makes complete yeah. sense. Is there any data that shows that because of the, the, the struggles that you went through, that you were failing classes or you took semesters off or any, any data like that? No. So, okay. Well, uh, I got like a C in like uh, one of like uh, like an ecology class, and uh, that was kind of like the lowest grade. Like during that, like after yeah. the, after the yeah after the pandemic and stuff like that, okay. or at least after of it. So like that was probably like the biggest one. Yeah, I would say. So that's that's nothing, right? Lots of people had worse grades during the pandemic because they didn't like learning on zoom or whatever so I, I wouldn't worry about that I, I think you should tell your story and and focus on right being isolated and and being lonely and what you did to to handle that right it, it's not just the fact that you were battling some depression there or whatever it is that you were going through what did you do to to counteract that how did you grow through that and, and obviously if if you didn't fail out of classes and and uh, need to take semesters off. And, and sometimes those are okay too, but it shouldn't give the medical school any kind of red flags that, oh my gosh, you're not going to be able to handle medical school. You're going to fail out, whatever. So I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about it. Tell your truth and I think it'll all come through. Well, that was really like the majority of the questions that I had so far like off my head. But I don't know if you can kind of just keep talking to me and like maybe I could think of something. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to just keep talking to you? I'll I'll, uh, I'll read you some yeah. some uh, some bedtime stories. <laughs> yeah, well, like um, I'm sorry, my, my, uh, that's okay. Um, so so I wanna um, I wanna actually rewind a little bit. You mentioned earlier your your path into medicine came through teaching. Mm -hmm. There there are lots of ways to use teaching outside of medicine. So I want to make sure that you really tell your story appropriately of how you how you connected those dots because it's not a clear logical connection. Right. Yeah. So essentially, it was like you know in high school, like you know being in the football team, you know everyone kind of just started like you know to go to college to play football and like that's how I would do and stuff. So, but like you know take like learn. Like I took a anatomy and physiology course and like you know my teacher made the class so like just like fun and like just interesting. It was like one of the classes like in high school, like I was like really like invested in. So I wanted to, uh, you know, like pursue that more. So I switched my major from engineering to you know, biology. And um, over time and things like that, like I just became, like, I just loved like, you know, learning about science and stuff like that. And I was able to get like a tutoring job um, 
for my school at the coaching center. And, you know, through that, like, obviously I met like other pre-med students and stuff like that. And they started to like, and I was, as I was teaching them, um, you know, like I just had the fulfillment in teaching. And when I, sh- I started to shadow like uh, academic physicians and stuff, and, you know, I just kind of fell in love with uh, just like- Why did you, why did you start shadowing physicians? Because I wanted to know more so about like kind of day the day of like what uh, doctors did. But um, why? Yeah. How, how did you get into physician? So you, you, you're you studying okay. anatomy and physiology. Maybe I missed a point. You're studying anatomy and physiology. Mm-hmm. The professor made it fun. You liked it. You switched your major. But why the connection to medicine? Why not just go be an anatomy physiology teacher? Oh, okay. All right. I see what you're saying. So, yeah. So it was actually like this happened kind of a couple of times, but like, you know, my sister, like she got like sick, um, for like, I think she had some sort of like pneumonia or something like that. And, you know, she had to take like these antibiotics. Right. And, um, like she hates taking pills, like, especially like now, even though she's like, you know, about to go to college, she's taking pills, but, like, you know, so she didn't want to take, you know, the, the rest of the pills. And I was telling her from like what we learned in class, like, you know, you got to finish your antibiotics or else, you know, that bacteria is better than before. Yep. So like, you know, that whole like educating people to kind of like being able to take action and actually know how to, you know, navigate through life and, you know, make the best options. Just basically giving them the most options so that way they can take control of their life and, you know, be or take initiative in their care. Like that's like what gives me like, I guess, purpose, fulfillment. I don't know what kind of word yep. I'm going to use, but I, was, I guess like... I had like multiple like experiences like that within like my house and even like on my team, my football teammates, like if they got like injured and stuff, like I'm trying to like think of like what we learned in anatomy class to kind of like help them like, you Perfect. know, even those, those, constraint, right? the, so, those are the stories that you need to bring up when you're talking about why you want to be a doctor. That's what really connects yeah. the dots. Okay. Yeah. And that was that my sister's story. That was my personal statement. So, Good. Good. Yeah. What do your parents do? My dad is a pharmacist. At, uh, uh-huh. So there, there's yeah. some connection to health, the health field already. Okay. I, sure, I, yeah. I, I think you need to, you need to include that as well, right? So, so okay, sure. having your dad, who's a pharmacist, is is something that he obviously brings home, uh, and, and it's not doctor, right? That we consider right MDDO, but he's he's working in the health field helping patients and, and that's something that's already kind of implanted in your head of like, oh, there's there are these people out there that help in these medical situations. Right, right. What does what your mom do? She's an attorney. She uh, practices uh, personal injury and immigration. So she's okay. like her own. Yeah. Thing. So so personal injury, again, my, my wife is big in the personal injury world now as a concussion specialist. Um, there, there's a lot of medical stuff that your mom's probably talking about as well. <laughs> so there, there's yeah, some connections yeah. out there. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and like one thing too, that I, cause one of the secondaries for school, like they have like two boxes where it's like, or, uh, you can choose two things out of like a list of like, you know, uh, interests that you want to do. With. And like one of them is like academic medicine mm-hmm. and stuff. So, um, Obviously, like I said, like, I don't know exactly what my path will be once I graduate from med school, but like, I would, I think academic medicine will definitely be like something that's like on the top of my list just because makes complete sense. With, like kind of, yeah. Right. Right. And then, um, so yeah, cool. hopefully like, I know it definitely gave me words of encouragement and, you know, now I'm kind of like excited to kind of submit this application for these secondaries and stuff like that. So I appreciate the time, Dr. Gray.